Plato's time. A lot of us are sort of raised in the upper Western world to think of Zoroastrianism as Professor Darmester has himself said, almost like a ruined religion, uh, uh, a relic of ages past, lost through the mists of time. But the true reality of it is, is that it is a living, vibrant, and very, very, very deep in esoteric, mystical, metaphysical, philosophical, and ethical thought of a faith that uh, is possibly one of the oldest continuously practiced religions in human history. Um, it dates to possibly anywhere between 2,500 to 1,500 BCE, uh, with Zarathustra uh, having been from the Central Asian steppes. And I began learning these sort of facts uh, when I met those Zoroastrians in 2015. It was fascinating to me. I had thought they were all gone. Uh, and I became enraptured learning more, reading everything I could. You, I bet a lot of us can sort of relate to the fact of gaining a new sort of spiritual interest and in just diving in fully into the deep end. And I did that and eventually found out that this aligned to a lot of my spiritual, ethical, and metaphysical thoughts, which led me to not just uh, undertake the Navjot, or as they call it in Iran, the Sedre Pushi, uh, in 2018, which is the initiation ceremony in front of one of the sacred fires, but also uh, to go, as previously mentioned, to SOAS University of London, where they have the Sapurji Palonji Institute of Zoroastrian Studies, uh, where I got my MA in Zoroastrianism, followed then by an MDiv in uh, comparative and multi-religious theology, centering around Zoroastrianism as well. And currently, I'm in the process of gaining my uh, doctorates, uh, at a graduate theological union in Berkeley, uh, where I am studying currently Zoroastrian influences on alternative spiritual movements in North America and Europe. Uh, so do watch out for more on that. Um, but, uh, let's talk a little bit about Zoroastrianism and sort of what it means, its core, its history, and the like. Uh, in the upcoming uh, Watkins magazine that's coming up, I will have an article published called The Hidden Magus, The Magic and Mysticism of Zarathustra's Gathas. Um, and I'll be reading sections of it from here as well. So if anything sounds familiar when you pick up that magazine, now you know that you got a little bit of a preview. So let's start... Uh, as some uh, gatherings of Zoroastrians tend to, with reciting one of the sacred mantras. Uh, that's with an H uh, before the R, uh, unlike sort of what we hear in sort of Vedic descended traditions of mantra. Uh, mantra is what it's called in sort of religions that are descended from the Indo-Iranic, Proto-Indo-Iranic traditions of Central Asia, Iran, and what we would call the Persianate world, uh, which is actually more vast and encompassing than what we would consider today as modern day Iran. Zoroastrianism itself spread all the way from the courts of China to uh, evidence uh, has been seen in places as far as Sicily and Egypt to even possibly as far south as uh, Zanzibar, Arabia, and far north as Russia. So uh, over, as I mentioned, over 3,500 years ago in the Central Asian steppes, an enlightened mystic wandered from village to village, temple to temple, reciting a set of mystical, ethical, and powerful songs that would be known as the Gathas of Zarathustra. Those songs are preceded by mantras and are also followed up at the end by mantras. One of those mantras, my personal favorite, is the Ashem Vohu it is very simple, and I'll recite it now uh, for you. Zoroastrians typically uh, cover their heads, but it's a very hot day over here for me. So some just put their hands over their heads in order to recite. And they extend their hands forward uh, with palms stretched out, as mentioned actually in the first line of the Gathas by Zarathustra. Ashem vohu vahishtamashti ushtashti ushtamai hiatashai vahishtai ashem. 
Now, that short and simple, beautiful mantra, uh, it precedes the gathas in what is known as Yasna 27 uh, in verses uh, verse 14. Uh, the Yasna is the core text of the Avesta, which is a compilation of Zoroastrian scriptures written in what would have been the original language of Zarathustra, Avestan, which is the Proto-Iranic language from, from which many Iranic languages descend from. So what's that prayer mean that I just recited in uh, a very melodic Avestan? It says, Asha is virtuous and magnificent. And joy upon joy is what Asha provides, for thus is Asha Bahishta. But what is Asha? So Asha in itself is many multi, it has a grand multiplicity, to say the least. Uh, see, the mystic journey in Zoroastrianism, the religion of the Gathas, also known as Mazda Yasna, which uh, can be translated as the worship of wisdom, uh, involves aligning one's consciousness with Asha, the life force of existence empowered by virtue and mantras, and by cultivating a deep spiritual connection with Ahura Mazda, the sevenfold primordial of wisdom, the highest of all divinities within uh, Zoroastrianism. Asha itself uh, it can be considered truth cosmic order, the underlying reality of all things, in a comparative theological uh, sort of attempt to try to explain Asha, which is mystery beyond mystery. Um, it is somewhere close, but not exactly, and a little bit in between all of these to say, conceptions of the Tao in Taoism, uh, the Noose and Neoplatonism, and other similar sort of active forces of creation and existence. And uh, in uh, Zoroastrianism, one of the main cores of uh, what to do is to align to Asha, because aligning to Asha awakens uh, the inner spirit, the inner fire, um, and allows us to not just gain spiritual metaphysical advantages, but also uh, to maintain a, a reservoir of virtue and also to uh, surpass even our own sort of human understandings, mortal understandings and uh, limitations. And so, so this is built through that deep connection with Ahura Mazda and Ahura Mazda meaning something akin to wise Lord, or even can be translated as sovereign wisdom. So this connection is not merely intellectual, but experiential too, involving a direct communion between the individual and the divine through contemplation, prayer, ritual practices, and meditation along, and most importantly, with ethical practice. Uh, this ethical practice uh, through the cultivation and action of virtue is done through what is known as the threefold path of Asha, which is virtuous thoughts, virtuous words, and virtuous deeds. Uh, by undergoing this constant sort of threefold path, uh, one chooses to align themselves to Asha. Choice is central to Zoroastrianism and is found in the Gathas as exceedingly central. Free will is viewed not as just some gift from the divine or something granted uh, or a mistake or anything like that, but is actually viewed as core and essential to existence itself. Um, and so this has been happening for uh, this sort of thought and theological understanding has developed through these poetic missives of the Gathas, Gathas meaning songs or poems uh, or hymns. These are the original compositions of Zarathustra. And Zarathustra himself was a figure who lived in the Central Asian steppes, wandering around uh, what would be sort of uh, modern day northeastern Iran uh, and also the area around uh, the Aral 
RLC uh, or what used to be the RLC. Sadly, now it is mostly gone. Um, but uh, Zathusha's uh, time was that he was likely a priest in the uh, proto iranic religion, uh, which was continued through Zoroastrianism. There's a lot of confusion as to where some Zoroastrian divinities may have emerged from, uh, say like Mithra, uh, which many folks who have any interest in uh, esoteric thinking or met a metaphysical thinking, or even sort of European religion will remember Mithra, Mithra uh, through the Mithraic rites. Uh, Mithra, Anahita, and so forth, uh, they developed from this proto uh, Iranic religion, which Zathusha was likely a priest and a mantran in, a reciter of the mantras. So likely part of his tradition was to wander from place to place reciting uh, the mantras, reciting, uh, you know, tales, stories, conducting rituals, uh, engaging in healing practices and the like. Uh, sacrifices and so forth. Zarathustra was born into a time in which uh, there began to develop sort of uh, a settled agricultural pastoral life as opposed to nomadic raiding and uh, nomadic culture. And Zarathustra even mentions this throughout the Gathas, how much better it is to actually uh, remain settled, to not engage in raffle raiding, to not engage in thievery, uh, and to engage in hospitable, welcoming, communitarian practices. Uh, to The community is very important in Zoroastrianism, and not just sort of the Zoroastrian community, but the global community, the local community, the national community, and more so. Um, and so Zarathustra, at first, was uh rejected he only had one convert his uh his cousin Majionanga and uh afterwards sort of wandered from place to place was cast aside by king and priest everywhere uh until he found a uh a poet king known as Vishtaspa uh who the Greeks would call his pasties and uh, Vishtaspa uh, became his patron, and thus from there, uh, the religion spread uh, in what was likely the region of the BMAC, which is the Bactria Marginalia agri uh, Archaeological Complex, as we call it today, uh, in, in the exact area likely known as the Yaz culture. Uh, these are all, of course, very educated academic speculations. That part of history is so beyond the mist of times that it's very difficult to put anything into its true concrete statement. But that is definitely what we can say. But uh, these poetic misses were passed down orally for centuries before being recorded in the spiritually charged language of Avestan. Uh, and they unveil profound esoter and esoteric dimensions of spiritual exploration and ethical meditations that have influenced in a variety of ways almost any form of theological and metaphysical thinking from China to Europe. Uh, I labeled this article that's coming up as the Hidden Magus because uh, Zarathustra, the Magi, uh, who were some of the original priestly uh, casts of Zoroastrianism, and other sort of concepts within Zoroastrianism are not just semi-adopted here and there by European thinkers or Islamic thinkers, and but sometimes adopted wholesale or even viewed with not just a deep fascination, but almost a, what I like to joke as a metaphysical addiction. Um, Pythagoras was said to have learned under Zarathustra chronologically impossible, but nonetheless, that just shows how important Zarathustra was to the ancient Greeks at that time. Plato was said to have uh, plagiarized by his contemporaries uh, his writings and teachings from Zarathustra, uh, various other figures such as Herodotus, uh, uh, Philo, and so forth. They all 
engage with Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism shows up during the great renaissance uh, in the thinking of uh, the platonic schools of Florence and uh, amongst great thinkers like Mirandola, Jamistus Pletho, and so forth. Uh, Zarathustra is mentioned offhand in some grimoires. Zarathustra is mentioned even further by great philosophers like Voltaire, uh, by Nietzsche, and so forth. The Magi, even our very word uh, magic comes from the name of the Magi because Arthustra was viewed as being, even up until recently, and even by many folks still, as the first magician, the first astrologer, the first prophet, and generally the source of philosophia, of the love of wisdom. Philosophia itself basically being etymologically cognate to Mazda Yasna, a worship or love of wisdom as well. And so uh, when, uh, when, uh, when engaging you know, with uh, Zoroastrianism through the Gathas, one notices also that uh, the mind is very important. This mind of ours is a gateway to the two realms that exist within Zoroastrianism of the material and the spiritual, uh, viewed as the physical and the imaginal. Imaginal not meaning non-existent, but rather uh, in almost a platonic sense, if it can be imagined, the idea of it must exist. Uh, where insights are gained uh, by aiding in the cosmic conflict against Angra Manu, also known as Ariman, the destructive spirit, uh, which exists in the hearts of all mortal beings, but is nonetheless non-existent. Evil or uh, druj, which is known as the lie. Druj literally translates as the lie. An illusion is uh, actually uh, the great illusion, the anti-life without substance and essence, which corrupts the mind and through it existence. And the only way to combat it and break through that illusion is by embracing virtue uh, through alignment to Asha. And uh, the uh, by aiding uh, in this cosmic metaphysical battle, uh, you stand in support of the seven emanations of Ahura Mazda, known as the Amesha Spenta, which translates as the bountiful immortals, and particularly Spenta Manu, the sacred spirit of creation itself, uh, which is the active force of creation. Destruction thus must be contained so that creativity may flourish, creativity being the number one uh, force which is valued in Zoroastrianism. And thus, perhaps the two may one day uh, be transcended as well. Uh, the Gathas mention uh, that uh, perhaps uh, destruction and creation may one day be fully aligned and brought into harmony with one another so that they may be transcended. So the goal of every Zoroastrian actually thus is to become an Ashavan, a master of Asha, which alongs potentials that have remained dormant and unrealized in the conscious being due to having been clouded by the mists of Druj. Ashavans then work in concert with Ahura Mazda and the Yazata, those worthy of worship as it translates, uh, god beings who are everything from hypostatic entities to great heroes, to ancestral forces, to powerful spirits. Uh, they can range from traditional ones for the Iranic homelands, like I mentioned, Mithra, Anahita, uh, and uh, other great uh, Yazata, uh, to even deities from other pantheons and lands found to be Ashavic in nature. We have countless evidence of this happening in places such as Armenia, the Kushan Empire, in uh, Western China um, and in Komagene, which Anatolia, uh, where you can find not just syncretizations, but also adoptions of divine figures from these regions, uh, which are thus culturally localized as Erasmianism was in many ways, uh, 
as long as they themselves were viewed as aligned to Asha. So deities of wrath, of of sheer violence, of greed, of malice, of oppression, of tyranny, these were rejected uh, and viewed as being Davic, Deva, those not to be worshipped. And those who were thus adopted into the Azotic principle uh, were viewed as welcome even today in India amongst the Parsi Zoroastrian Indian community who fled after the Islamic invasion of Persia to India uh, in modern day Gujarat. Uh, some of them have even adopted figures such as Ganesh, Kali, and the like, and even engage with local sort of divine saints, sort of uh, Satya Sai Baba and other types as well. Um, and so this remains sort of open in this sort of sense. Uh, and uh, thus the Russians around the world uh, maintain their cultural ties, not just to say regions from which they emerge in diaspora, but also like Iran and India, uh, and including converts such as yours truly, I still maintain ties to these regions, which I have no blood ancestral ties to, but have spiritually ancestral ties to. But nonetheless, what is important to us is making sure that our Zoroastrianism reflects where we are at, meaning not just where we are in the modern world. Uh, our religion is called to be a progressive face, meaning it is constantly moving, adapting, processing. Uh, with elements of process theology thus in that regard. And uh, thus, when we also engage, say, in North American Zoroastrianism or British Zoroastrianism or Hong Kong or Zoroastrianism, so on and so forth, you will always see variations because they adopt from these regions. This is what has kept Zoroastrianism alive uh, for thousands upon thousands of years. Uh, where they have maintained some of the same rituals, such as the practice and reading of the yasna, which is one of the main central evocative rituals of Zoroastrianism, or um, the various different afrinagans, uh, rituals of thanksgiving, and other uh, practices that sort of unite us to uh, the magi and the spiritual ancestors, all the way to the first Zoroastrian community in which nature was venerated. The Rashians are called to in the Yasna Hatangaiti, uh, which means the sevenfold God, uh, Yasna, uh, to, uh, which was the original liturgy of the first Zoroastrian community to worship the waters, to worship the earth, to worship the, uh, the winds, uh, to worship the ancestors and so forth, um, calling upon us to view nature around us as a uh as all divine and having elements of consciousness of the divine consciousness and fire imbued into it fire is thus not only viewed as divine but also as a conduit of our prayers uh it, it is viewed as uh with such deep love and respect that some of the uh earliest Zoroastrian uh, compositions refer to fire as the son of Ahura Mazda, not in a literal sense, but more of in the sense of a note, a marker of respect. Uh, and thus the name of fire is Atar, uh, Crimson Atar. Um, and uh, thus any Zoroastrian temple or even shrine or even household will have at least some sort of small burning fire, even if only temporarily during prayers, rituals, or holy days as well. Uh, so one can actually eventually also become as fire, as wind, as earth, as Mithra, as Anahita, uh, Yazatic, through communication and union with one's Pravashi, the Fravashi is a sort of higher genius of sorts, uh, the greater spirit of one soul that remains in the house of song, the citadel of the divines found in the spiritual realm, because it is viewed that uh, humans do not have just one soul. Our, our soul, if we're defining it in almost 
uh, because the conception of the way we think about souls now nowadays is so Christological that to have a conception of a multifaceted soul seems almost very Eastern. And that's because Zoroastrianism itself influenced both East and West through its position right at the center of it all. Uh, so thus, the Farvashi is viewed as maintaining its position as, say, if one were to look at, say, magical systems which have conceptions of a holy guardian angel or the higher genius or uh, the agathos daimon and so forth uh these uh are close but not quite and influenced even by the conception of the uh fravashi uh and then there's also the the soul that remains within uh the mortal the human uh which both are considered to be immortal and will one day after uh, the passing of the mortal body will go towards unity to bring back those experiences and knowledge gained through this mortal life uh, to aid not just in the cosmic conflict, but towards what is known as the making perfect, the completion of creation, the frasho kereti. Uh, in which all Zoroastrians are called to aid Ahura Mazda in the perfection of reality, of what is, of creation, of existence, of the universe, of the cosmos. Um, because it is viewed as an unfinished labor still. Uh, Ahura Mazda is not viewed as omnipotent, but as omniscient, of knowing all the ways and paths, all the branching of the trees. Uh, and in this way... Uh, this is why free will is also maintained so heavily. Ahura Mazda knows all the ways, but does not control all the ways. However, Ahura Mazda assures Zarathustra that all the paths actually lead towards the Frasho Kareti, which is the making perfect. And we are called upon to aid in that process as well. Um, so the threefold path of Asha, which is the considered the main path to aid in this process, is enhanced through wisdom. And wisdom is not just gained within Zoroastrianism. In fact, Zarathustra says uh, in the Gathas that uh, one should seek wisdom wherever it can be found. And uh, this has led to Zoroastrians uh, not just engaging with other philosophies, religious traditions, and so forth, but also engaging with the sciences, of the arts, with uh, uh, being responsible for various discoveries and so forth. Uh, Zoroastrians have been everything from rock superstars such as Freddie Mercury from Queen uh, to great philosophers such as Homi Baba and uh, even further to um, you know, great uh, sci scientists such as Cyrus Punwala and more so. Uh, to aviators such as the Tata family. Uh, and so we see sort of uh, this call towards and pull towards wisdom continuously. Uh, and thus, Asha entails the importance of the life one lives, though life now is considered to be exceedingly important. But the spiritual realm is not to be cast away. It is to be brought into unity eventually through the Frasha Kareti with our realm. The unity of both realms is viewed as an essential path and goal. Thus the cruciality of righteousness and virtue in one's day-to-day -day thoughts, words, and actions are important through charity, love, fighting against injustice, seeking wisdom wherever one may find it, protecting and venerating the natural world and other such ashavic matters become crucial uh, thus, in this path of Ashavic enlightenment. This is what Zarathustra set forth in the Gathas and in the Old Avestan texts. Thus, to say, these ancient texts and individuals, uh, these ancient texts invite individuals to embark on a transformative journey that integrates the intellectual, the ethical, and experiential dimensions of spirituality, mysticism, and our beautiful existence ultimately seeking union with the divine and the realization of the inherent divine fire within each soul. Thus, to close it off and open it up for questions, uh, thus a universal power awaits being unlocked once more 
and Zarathustra, as I do, invites you all to learn, understand, and possibly even follow the threefold path and the blessings that are inherent within. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing what sort of questions, comments, and uh, other sort of insights uh, this wonder com wonderful community may have for me here. So Avestan, as mentioned before, it was the proto-Iranic language of Zarathustra's people, of Zarathustra himself. Um, it is from which the modern day Farsi Persian, modern Persian language descends from, um, along with other languages as well uh, that come from this sort of Persianate sort of region. Um, Avestan is viewed with reverence amongst Zoroastrians as being the language of Zarathustra. And in fact, uh, the spoken Avestan was viewed with such reverence that Zoroastrianism was a completely oral tradition uh, up until the time of the three great Persian empires, the Achaemenids, the Parthians, and the Sasanians, where attempts and developments were made to grab these ancient compositions and write them down into literary form. Uh, as such, Avestan did not have a written script until it was formulated by the priests, uh, likely of the Parthian uh, or Sasanian era. Um, and uh, the script itself was written with spiritual uh, and metaphysical ideas in mind. Uh, Avestan is viewed uh, as having metaphysical properties when spoken. And so thus the lettering used, uh, the script used was to be markers for the priests of those times to know how to say it, when to say it, what sort of pitch to use and so forth. Um, and uh, you'll find arguments in the Zoroastrian community today. Well, I joke because we're, we're so cord on free will that uh, if you get a room of 10 Zoroastrians, you'll come out with 15 different opinions. So this happens too with Avestan and its potency. Some Zoroastrians will believe that Zoroastrian is, that Avestan has a vibratory spiritual metaphysical nature that when spoken directly banishes Davic thought and uh, banishes uh, any sort of uh, possibly druge related activity. It banishes the illusion. Um, Others believe uh, that it is so sacred that it can only be spoken uh, when engaged with other Zoroastrians. And uh, those folks would believe that me saying it to you is inappropriate. However, um, there are also those who believe that by speaking of Estin uh, to others, they are gained, and I believe in this school myself, they are gained the blessings are gained towards them and towards the speaker of uh, that come within the Avestan language and especially through the mantras themselves. There are four sacred mantras who are believed to have uh, massive spiritual, metaphysical, divine potential within them, such as the, the Hashem Vohu, which I stated. And there's one known as the Hunavar, which is considered to be the most sacred and was viewed as possibly the primordial utterance of Ahura Mazda uh, to speak what is into existence. So there, th you'll find it also in my translation. In parentheses, I'll put times three, times four, times two uh, for certain sections. And it's only for those particular sections. Uh, repetition uh is viewed as not just important for one's learning in Zoroastrianism, but also as powerful in and of itself. Imagine it as almost filling a spiritual battery of sorts. So when a priest today, uh no longer called Magi, but Mobeds instead, uh, when a Mobed uh is doing, say, the Yasna ritual, which includes the Gathas, uh, they will recite 
uh, some of these mantras multiple times, sort of to build the store of spiritual energy and power within the ritual. Because uh, Zoroastrian rituals uh, come from the proto indo iranic tradition of the triangular ritual format. So a let's say if I, I, one corner of the triangle, come towards the priest, the other corner of the triangle, and commission a ritual from him for the blessings upon my household. Then the priest uh, conducts the yasna ritual or whatever other ritual, which acts as a feast and sacrifice and invitation towards whatever divinity is being invoked, usually Ahura Mazda, one of the Yazatas, all of them together, the ancestors, what have you. Um, and they are invited to feast upon the consecrated elements of uh, the ceremony. In the Yasna, that would be the, the sacred and mystical beverage, Haoma. Uh, that would be the Dron, which are almost Eucharistic-like uh, sort of uh, leaven, sort of cakes of sorts, bread, um, and uh, other fruits and vegetables, which are thus provided. In some rituals, this also involves an offering of animal fat, and so forth, um, and water, and the like. Um, and thus, it is as if the divinity is invited to come down and feast amongst the priest uh, to then transfer the ritual uh, blessings, not just to the priest for having conducted the ritual, but also to the person who commissioned the ritual and the community as a whole. Thus, a triangular fashion is developed in this sort of sense. Um, and part of that is sort of building up the spiritual store to make the deity manifest, to make the divinity manifest. Um, and thus the power of the divine is brought forth and then released onto uh, the priest, the person commissioned the ritual and the community. Rituals are not done, say, in the sense of, say, the Catholic mass every just Sunday or anything like that. Uh, they are viewed as special uh, and thus are usually only commissioned or done for special uh, holy days, such as Noruz, the most sacred day of the Zoroastrian calendar, the spring act of Winox, or done for other great celebrations as well. That's the remembrance of the birth or death of Zarathustra and the like, um, or commemorations of uh, the death of a loved one or the birth of a new child, and so forth. Um, and as such, uh, there is no, the temples are not viewed as regular gathering spaces, uh, but rather special gathering spaces uh, when engaged in ritual. And usually the temples have centers attached to them, which are instead used as gathering spaces for uh, feasts, holidays, celebrations of weddings, funerals, and so forth. Uh, in which prayers are thus recited sometimes multiple times over, as is noted in the, the ritual texts. Yes, no, excellent questions. Uh, I'll start with the Alexander question first. Um, so Alexander in the Zoroastrian tradition is not called the great. Uh, Alexander in the Zoroastrian tradition is called the accursed, um, not just for the destruction of what was the first Persian empire, basically the empire of Cyrus the Great, uh, who, funny enough, uh, uh, Alexander modeled himself after. Alexander viewed Cyrus as such a massive role model that he carried a copy of the Cyropedia with him everywhere he went. And to take over Persia, uh, it, it's sort of like, you know, in the modern day, uh, you run across those folks that are way far too obsessed with Japan. And then they go to Japan and just fall in love with it even further. The same thing happened to Alexander. Uh, we have records of this from his generals who would say that Alexander went native, basically, adopted Persian dress and customs, uh, sat upon the throne of Cyrus, uh, you know, went to the... A tomb of, of Cyrus and basically wept and all this other stuff. Um, but uh, I think that it, academically, I can definitely tell you that uh, we are not certain if Alexander actually had any influence on Zoroastrianism at all. In uh, yes, 
Persepolis did burn down. It may have been the fault of a drunken Alexander as the legends go, or may have been done deliberately to create a new center of power for Alexander. However, we have no record knowing that uh, any of the Zoroastrian compositions were written down at this time. The earliest records we have of Zoroastrian compositions being written down is in the late Parthian, early Sasanian period. Um, and even then, uh, we're not particularly sure if those are just stories or the reality of things, because the oldest uh, text that we have relating to anything Zoroastrian is not actually from the Persian region, but rather from China, uh, from what is today the Uyghur lands uh, in northwestern China. So as such, um, we're not particularly sure if there were even any texts for uh, Alexander to, any sacred texts for Alexander to burn down and burn away. Uh, the only reason we think this is because uh, post-Islamic invasion texts such as uh, the Denkard, which is sort of an encyclopedia of Zoroastrianism at its time, uh, and a gathering of theological opinions, uh, mentions lost books of the Avesta. But we're not particularly sure uh, where they were. And if they were of terrible uh, theological importance, uh, it's very likely that they would have been memorized and brought uh, into exile or kept amongst the Iranian community that has remained uh, in Iran, the Zoroastrian Iranian community that has remained in Iran since the times of Cyrus and Zarathustra and the like. Um, but none has been memorized. There have been no physical texts of any of these. So they remain in a realm of speculation. Um, Alexander thus, uh, I think, and this is going to be controversial to some of my Zoroastrian friends who may be uh, here right now. I think Alexander may be a little bit too maligned uh, through these legends of, uh, of destroying Zoroastrian texts. What is very likely to have happened is if those Zoroastrian texts existed, is that they were discarded with the changing of the times. We see this actually happen in a lot of post-Islamic invasions, Zoroastrianism. New texts develop. These texts become more core and essential to Zoroastrianism. There are texts that were essential, say, in the 1000s or 1500s even, that Zoroastrians nowadays do not even read or care about uh, because it does not relate to their times or to the religion as it is today or to new understandings, whether metaphysical, ethical, or theological. Um, so yes, and, uh, and Alexander, it should be noted that we do know academically and historically that he sponsored almost every faith he came across because it provided legitimacy to his reign. Famously, he went to Egypt and declared himself the son of Amun-Ra. Uh, and in Persia, he conducted uh, all the various enthronement ceremonies that would have been done to an Achaemenid Persian ruler at the time. So that's what I have to say about Alexander. Uh, if there are any lost texts, it would be wonderful to regain them and to study them. But sadly, we live in the political reality that as long as the Islamic Republic may, remains in charge of Iran, archaeological and uh, scriptural excavation and study remains exceedingly difficult due to the uh, disdain, to say the least, that the administration there has against Zoroastrianism um, and strong Zoroastrian study. As to worship at home, uh, in fact, most Zoroastrian practice, worship, and uh, development happens within the household. It is viewed as core and essential. Uh, temples are lovely sacred spaces. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's not, say, like a Catholic church where one is required to be there every Sunday and thus forms the core of community and central life, um, of spiritual life at its core. But Instead, spiritual life is in the household, where it is believed, uh, and so in Zoroastrianism and the Gathas, gender parity 
on matters spiritual are all uh, is declared by Zarathustra. Women and men and whatever other genders are viewed to be in unity with one another, in equality, in sheer equality when it comes to spiritual matters in particular. Uh, and thus the household is viewed as a shrine, a temple in and of itself. Uh, a lot of Zoroastrians keep what is known as a diva, which is sort of an oil burning lamp or oil burning uh, uh, sort of device that keeps a fire burning or going. A perpetual fire or hearth fire, what have you, uh, has been traditional for Zoroastrianism. Is it required? Absolutely not. Very little is actually required in Zoroastrianism. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for prayer, Zoroastrians are called to point themselves towards a source of fire or light. So Zoroastrians who are not near fire, say if I were in the middle of, say, the new forest in England, I would point myself towards the sun because it is a giant fire. Uh, if, uh, if I were, say, in front of my computer, electricity is viewed as a fire. And so therefore, I can point myself towards the computer because electricity suffuses through it or say the light that hangs above in the ceiling and so forth. Um, but most Zoroastrians prefer to keep on themselves at least a small uh, sort of uh, candle of some sort or oil lamp or something. Sometimes they will travel with it and uh, light it, do their rituals and prayers in front of it. Um, the household is also where the great feasts and celebrations of the holy days are done. You're supposed to invite other Zoroastrians, your neighbors, non-Zoroastrians as well, to come and feast and enjoy. One of the things I love about Zoroastrianism is it has more days of celebration than almost any other spiritual system I've ever encountered. Uh, because Zoroastrians are not called to deprive themselves of anything. They're called to enjoy all things in moderation through the what is known as the middle path of the threefold path. Um, and so thus nothing is denied to a Zoroastrian, uh, except it is up to you to use your own good conscience, your vohumana, your, your virtuous mind, to be able to figure out how to engage with these things. And so feasting is very important. Drinking, celebration, uh, dancing reciting a poetry of telling of stories and so forth um and this happens in the household uh many times um and sometimes priests are brought into the household instead of the household going into the temple so that the priest may offer ceremonies such as the yashan the yashan is a thanksgiving ceremony it's the most common ritual performed in Zoroastrianism, and it's performed in households, temples, holy sites, and so forth. You'll find images of the Yashan being promote, uh, done at Mount Damavand in Iran, because it is the most sacred mountain in Zoroastrianism. And you'll find Yashan images done in uh, apartments in, in London, uh, uh, because it may be a great celebration of someone's graduation or birthday or what have you. And you'll find Yashans done in the temples to celebrate, say, like, remembrance of the death of Zarathustra or Noruz or what have you. Uh, so yes, uh, the household is important. And the Gathas feature into this because Zoroastrians for many of these holy days will set up altars, uh, which involve having a copy of the Gathas or the Cordea Vesta, which is sort of like, uh, you know, the Anglican comparison would be the Book of Common Prayer and stuff like that. Uh, or we'll have a copy of the Shahnameh, which is a collection of Zoroastrian myths. Um, and there will be images of, say, Zarathustra, mirrors, flowers, representations of the sevenfold nature of Ahura Mazda and the Amesh of Spenta. Um, and folks are called to read upon the Gathas. Sometimes a bit of bibliomancy occurs when the Gathas are open, uh, you know, uh, point, uh, a finger is put in a random part of the uh, Gathas, and that verse is thus interpreted to mean how one's life may continue forward from that point. Uh, and thus a verse should be meditated upon. So yes, uh, the Gathas feature into household practice, and household practice is core and essential to Zoroastrianism.
Yes, I was speaking with uh, a few theologian friends of mine, as a theologian myself with Insurrectionism, um, and uh, one of the things that was brought up is that it almost seems as if Zoroastrianism was a future religion seeded in the past to develop for today. Um, and part of that has to do with what I mentioned earlier, which is the the progressional uh, processional sort of uh, nature of Zoroastrian theology, which is constantly adaptive, constantly evolving, constantly developing without losing its core. Um, and and this scene, even with the way that the Avesta is engaged with, you know, uh, a, a lot of folks uh, probably watching this may have developed in, if not in a Christian uh, or Abrahamic household, may have uh, in, very likely live in a society that did develop in a sort of Abrahamic sort of way, and thus are familiar with this conception of scripture as being either infallible or untouchable or can only be interpreted a certain way and everything. These concepts do not exist in Zoroastrian scripture. So uh, it is even to the point where combine this uh, progressional aspect and the aspect of free will, and thus you'll find Zoroastrians who reject entire books of the Avesta as being non-essential to their practice or to their understanding of the deeper metaphysical natures of Zoroastrianism. Because, for example, one of these books is the Vendidad, uh, which is a book of, uh, it, it's a code of practices and laws for the priests of the Sasanian period, mostly. And so thus is rejected by a lot of modern Zoroastrians, simply because it just doesn't apply to them anymore. And the truths and understandings gained from it can be gained without accepting the rest of the text. Um, but Zoroastrians almost universally nowadays do engage in all holding core to their faith, the Gathas. Um, and the Gathas themselves, Zathustra speaks to the, to the reader, to the listener at various points. Uh, and it seems almost as if he's there because of the things he speaks about too. It's just like, you know, we don't want to live in a wrathful world where wars are consistently happening. Uh, we don't want to be engaged in mistreatment of the environment and nature, lest nature itself rebel against us. Uh, we don't wish uh, to uh, succumb to illusions and lies and half-truths and, uh, you know, uh, this sort of unreality. Uh, that even grows amongst us today. And we do not want tyrants. We do not want oppression and so forth. And the, the, the sad truth is why a lot of these things seem so modern is because sadly, even thousands of years later, we are still dealing with a lot of the same issues. Uh, they seem so modern too, because we understand them better. Um, it almost seems as if Zarathustra uh, composes the Gathas with a hope that further down the line, there will be a greater understanding of what he means. Um, and I think personally and theologically that we are entering into that point as well. Zoroastrianism is experiencing a revival of interest, uh, not too dissimilar from say the revival of interest of Buddhism and Hinduism in the 60s and 70s. Uh, many people are talking about Zoroastrianism on many sides of the political equation, uh, rich and poor uh, in Japan, in Europe, in Latin America, in the United States and so forth. Uh, and I find it absolutely fascinating. I mean, just over the past five to 10 years, at least three new institutes of Zoroastrian studies have opened up in universities, uh, you know, in uh, California, in Toronto, in the UK, at SOAS, and more so. Um, so see, yes, we're, we're developing a burgeoning interest. And it's not just because ancient religions are fascinating, but also because it's all strangely and very fascinatingly applicable 
to the modern era. And even the theological metaphysical understandings almost seem like a development from the metaphysical understandings that we've all become accustomed to or have explored ourselves. Remember this whole idea of the hidden magus that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Zathustra, for those who are inclined towards the metaphysical, as most people at a Watkins talk would be, um, you will find in almost any system that you may already be inclined to some sort of influence from Zoroastrianism, whether that is Harry related magic in South India, uh, whether that is uh, uh, Thelemic thought of Aleister Crowley, whether that is theosophy, whether that is the new age, uh, whether that's Buddhism, uh, Taoism, uh, Greek philosophy, Neoplatonism more so, uh, any one of these that could be named, I can point to you where the Zoroastrian influence came in. And that is fascinating because now that we have greater knowledge and more access to knowledge than ever before, which Zathusha would have loved to have this great access and love of wisdom. I mean, we don't have the great love of wisdom that's required with so much access to wisdom and the respect that we should have towards wisdom. But nonetheless, uh, now we can get a better understanding of how Zoroastrianism has been basically a foundation to a lot of what we believe, practice, and how we have developed and where we are going as well. Um, yes, uh, yes, I happily uh, recite the last mantra, which is a great place to sort of end uh, any discussion on the Gathas, uh, for sure, because this is how the Gatha as a section ends. This is the last old Avestan uh, composition that happens here. Um, and uh, not just the Adyaman issue, but uh, uh, thus also uh, there is another mantra that is the absolute final one. And let me bring it up here. And uh, this was the Yenge Hatam. Uh, so I'll recite both of these. Uh, but before I do, let me also say that it's been a pleasure to talk to you all. It's been fantastic. Love joining you all. Find me on mazdayazni.com. Uh, M-A-Z-M-A-Z-D-A-Y-A-S-N-I.com. And you'll find some of my writings there. And you can reach me directly through the contact form as well if you have any further questions as well. Uh, and pretty soon, I will have a series on uh, Zoroastrianism uh, called Zoroastrianism 101 on uh, on YouTube. So if you search Zoroastrianism 101 on YouTube, you can already subscribe to the channel. It's called Soul Roots. And uh, the documentary series will be released later this year. And of course, my translation of the Gathas, the Sacred Gathas of Zarathustra and the Old Avestan Canon uh, can be found at Watkins itself and can be found also online or anywhere else that you buy books. Um, so yes, uh, let us recite them. Uh, let me recite it first in Avestan and then grab you the translation. If you would like to also know further understandings of what these uh, mantras mean, uh, you can also find them on the website as well. Arya yema yo rafedra yangu nabariaska nabariaska zarathustra vangyush rafedra manango yadaina vairim hanat mislem asya yasya ashim Yamish Yam Ahuro Masata Mazda. And what that means is may Aryaman bring aid, Aryaman being the Yazata that protects the community and also heals. So it's a healer divinity. May Aryaman bring aid to all the people of Zarathustra and uphold the enlightened spiritual teachings which deserve enviable praise. I plead for the empowerment which Ashi provides through Asha as Ahura Mazda has ordained. And to finish it up, let, I'll recite the Yenge Hatan. Yenge Hatan, at yezne paiti vango Mazda, Ahura Vaitha, Ashatasha, 
Yanghamsha Tashka Tashka Yazamaide. They that are who are of any gender, Ahura Mazda knows through Asha of their glorious sacrifices. Thus, we offer them worship. So thank you, and may you all be blessed through the blessings of Ahura Mazda. And as we say in Zoroastrianism, Ushtate, which means happiness be to you. Yes, have a lovely day. <laughs>